Right, good morning, ladies and gents. Uh, firstly, a big thank you for the invitation, and I believe my copywriter, Jupiter, is partly responsible. Susie, thanks for your letter. Um, a thank you to Alan Gray for this great social initiative. Uh, well done, Craig. You, uh, I, I respect what you've done. Um, you asked a good question about complacency. I want to ask... Um, I'm Gordon, by the way. Um, <laughs> two things really you need to know about me. One, in a series of midlife crises, number one. Number two, I'm in counseling on a whole bunch of issues. <laughs> okay. um, who here is generally satisfied about their life and stuff? Who's generally satisfied? Huh? You are? You are? Anyone else? You, you satisfied? Anyone else? Come, peeps. Are you satisfied generally? Yeah. Okay. One of my key outcomes is to leave you with a feeling that you have to become absolutely dissatisfied. <laughs> totally dissatisfied. Dissatisfied about what? About how we run businesses. Dissatisfied about how we care for societies. Dissatisfied by the fact that tonight millions of people around the world will not have eaten. Dissatisfied, a list that I can go on and on and on about. Peeps, smart people like you have to make yourself dissatisfied. Why? Answer, it might make you get off your ass and do something meaningful. Yep. So, yes, I'm a huge supporter of entrepreneurship, but for me, I believe in activist entrepreneurship. Young people today have to create business organizations that add meaningful value. The old model of shareholder value is past a sell-by date. It's a mean, vicious model. It's failed. Society and, 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 and countries are way more complex than a simplistic idea that only the few get rewarded, like, hello? Right, what has this got to do with ideation? Dissatisfaction drives the need to find new ideas, to find ways to create and add value. So you start a business and I meet you later and I listen to you and the only sense I get from you is that the value you are creating is profit. You failed, in my view. You failed. Profit is a means to create and add value. It has got nothing to do with purpose of business. This might go against all your MBA lessons. Profit is <laughs> not the purpose of business. Profit is a result of doing business. It's a consequence. It's an enabler to create and add value. So the ideas I want us to encourage to, us to have is how do I create something that's going to add value? To whom? As many sausages as possible. Sausages is people. <laughs> okay, so first message Get yourself dissatisfied. Get yourself angry about stuff. Don't sleep well at night. <laughs> Serious. The world's not in a good place, peeps. Our country, our continent. Can we be satisfied? Please. All right. Uh, I'm in counseling on all those issues. Um, <laughs> where do ideas come from? Yeah, it's kind of a bit of a, you know, what's the difference between mind and brain? Uh, um, we talk about the imagination. Uh, the human imagination, for me, is the greatest asset in the entire world. Our human imagination is our greatest asset, and stuff happens in there. Um, what happens in the human imagination... Um, I want to give a metaphor to speed this up. Let me just quickly 
get to it. Capturing gas, turning it into liquid, and clever people like Craig um, can turn it into a solid. This is a process. It's quite a good metaphor for ideation. Ideas, cool thoughts, are like the world of gas. We're going to talk about how do you get gas. But it's just stuff there. It's unstructured, and suddenly you wake up with a cool idea. This is this world of gas. Now, a lot of us have cool ideas, and a large majority do nothing with them. We don't move down the process. Once you have a cool idea, you have to grab it, maybe write it down. This is now turning it into liquid. This, we're now entering innovation. You know, think of how you create music. You just get a melody from where? The imagination. Ding-a-ling. Bit of a dodgy one, but okay. Um, you go to the piano, ding-a-ling. And you start writing it down, and then you put chords after it, and you cross it out. We're now into a prototyping. So we are arm wrestling this thing. And there's a whole lot of paper in the dustbin. These are different prototypes. Till we feel we've got something solid that we can take to market. This is a lot of work. People say to me, our oh, creative, innovative people are lazy. They just have their feet on the desk and smoke stuff. Um, this is true. Um, <laughs> creative people are the hardest working people on earth. You want to see hard working people, go and speak to a great musician, a great artist. Engineers are lazy compared. Um, okay, so ideation is a process. Now, if we don't have a whole lot of swirling cool stuff in, in, in our world of gas, it's very hard to innovate. Now, let's understand clearly that great businesses, if you want to put down deep roots into your startup, you either need to do something totally different. That's going to need a big idea, cool concept. Either do something totally different, or you're going to do the same thing differently. Also going to need a bunch of ideas. Creating difference is critical in my view to a successful service or product offer. Creating difference. And to create difference, you need to have cool ideas. Craig's absolutely right. You've got to be prepared to run that whole process to execute it. Otherwise, it's just like playing with yourself. Um, I didn't mean it like that. Okay. Okay. So, innovation is ideas in action. I like that. Innovation is ideas and action. Okay, now, what goes wrong? And I want to quickly discuss with you, there are enablers to making this process live inside you, and there are a whole bunch of barriers. Let's start with some barriers. Why all of you smart people here have a lot of cool ideas. And I dare say some of you do arm wrestle them a bit, but I think if we're honest, a lot of these cool ideas you just sort of forget in the morning. Yeah? Um, what prevents us from taking some cool concept and pushing it through? Aside from hard work, and I agree absolutely with Craig, it's always hard work. There are a whole bunch of barriers. I I'm just going to give a few. A big one is framing. What do I mean by framing? Well, all of us are seeing a different world. True or false? All of you are getting a different seminar. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, how can we be? We're all in the same room. Because we are seeing and hearing through different frames. Um, give me one of your frames, sir. Uh, it's what happens when you sit in front, because you must be a nerd, so talk to me. <laughs> Yeah, that can be a frame. Yeah. I'm satisfied. My life's cool. What about the others? My life's cool. 
That is a frame of how you see the world. A very selfish, narcissistic <laughs> frame. Yeah? I was talking about the frame of how I see the question. I'm very dissatisfied with the world, but I have more than enough in my own life. I'm not wanting for more. Uh, is this you talking? Yeah. Are you in counseling? <laughs> okay. All right, now, so you've got a lot of issues, okay? Um, oh, give me another frame that you see the world through. Yes, very good. Your profession is a frame. You're a frame. That's what I admire about Craig. He, he, he's like bounced out of frames. I mean, the, there are engineers who at age 60 are still wearing the same gray shoes. <laughs> and they're just thinking the same for 45 years. Let's not talk about accountants. Um, <laughs> So, yes, your, your profession can frame you. It's a problem. Frames are barriers. Your gender is a frame. There's an incredible athlete, Chrissy Wellington, who said, who says men must always beat women in triathlons? She's the greatest triathlon, triathlon athlete in the world, and she beats most professional men in a while. Because she said, I'm not buying into this frame that women are the weaker sex. Where did this come from? It's a frame. Okay, so gender's a frame. In South Africa, color has to be a frame. Um, your schooling is a frame. Your culture is a huge frame. Your religion is a frame. Peeps, if you're going to build up this world of gas, you have to break out of frames. That's not comfortable. It's very cozy in your little frame. And the ultimate frame is the burial place. That's completely framed in a box. Okay. So, second metaphor is you must see yourself with this process, this ideation process. Gas, liquid, solid. Creative ideas, innovations, prototyping to market. This is like a river. Now, rivers need source and they need tributaries. You've got to feed this river. The problem is, when we kids, this river just overflows. Who's had kids here? Some of you still are kids. Who's had kids? You have. Yeah. Um, I promise you, you must go and sit in a playground and watch children if you want to feel alive. They just overflow with this process. Then we screw them up by making them adults. <laughs> and education is one of the worst framers, along with parents. Anyway, don't tell them that. Um, <laughs> Kids are, are so curious, which is a huge enabler, they're prepared to try anything. These three holes look interesting, fingers in. <laughs> Everything is up for an experiment. Everything. And that's why we learn so much when we were a child and then become dumb and dumber. Peeps, we have to become childlike again. We have to feed the source. How do you do it? Escalating your curiosity. Getting out of your comfort zone. Kids are prepared to go anywhere. He has a pool. I'm in. I mean, this is scary. Those of us have kids. They're up for anything. I have nothing to paint with in my nappy. And we're up. <laughs> that was me. Um, stopped that a few years ago. Okay. <laughs> Peeps, we have to break out of our little worlds. We have to meet other people. You have to travel. You have to read. You have to listen to different genres of music. You have to open your senses. You see, humans are fundamentally feeling entities. How do you know uh, you're alive? How do you know you're alive? You are alive, but how do you know? <laughs> Serious question, how do you know? Because you're feeling stuff. How, you, someone's lying there, and you, you're not sure. <laughs> and he doesn't move. You know you're dead when you stop feeling. So, we're all on a continuum. 
nearly dead, unbelievably alive. Everyone's on here. Creative people are alive. Accountants are dying. <laughs> Very small world. And I'm generalizing. There are some human accountants. Okay. Um, peeps, we're all there. We're all there. As children, we all feel an amazing amount. Because you see, when you feel, it means your sensory inputs are high. Your volume is up. You are seeing a lot. You're hearing a lot. You're tasting a lot. Feeling, tasting, all our main senses. Because that's how you get this river flowing. Seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. Once we have these inputs, we feel and you can emote. Then you're alive. So peeps, we have to raise our sensory inputs. See more, hear more, touch more. And that's not an invitation to some of the guys. Um, but that too. Taste more, smell more. Have to, peeps. We get, I saw my parents from about age 50 living the same life every year till they passed at about 70. That's why our people just even repeat the same stories. The coolest dude was Picasso, does his last amazing painting, then he, he, then he died. So peeps, I know young people who are just repeating this same life. We boxed in. So peeps, we have to be prepared to get out of our little world, see a much bigger society, see a much bigger world, and take in a whole lot of stuff. It's not comfortable. But that's the idea. Don't be comfortable. When you're comfortable, you're dead. Repeat, the most comfortable place. There's no distraction. It's in the box, in the ground. No phone calls, nothing. All right, peeps, my time's out because this is a big topic, but you smart people here and smart people who believe in the imagination is a magic mix because you have capability to add cognitive analytical skills to make things work.